events and programs, developing and communicating regional policy and strategy, overseeing young leadership and digital engagement initiatives, and more. Uh, prior to joining ADL in May 2012, Jeremy taught middle and high school social studies for three years in Philadelphia public schools. He earned his master's degree in education from the University of Pennsylvania and graduated magna cum laude from Brandeis University. Uh, Jeremy, what a pleasure to have you with us tonight. And I know we're all looking forward to hearing what you're going to share with us this evening. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, and thank you to you and to David and to the whole BZBI team for um, really uh, everything you've been doing during this uh, crazy time, this unprecedented pandemic. Um, you've really, uh, I've been uh, just really honored to be part of the BZBI community under your leadership. So thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's nice to be in front of a, a home crowd, um, literally people from, you know, I, I was in that home, my parents are, <laughs> are, are here, um, and, uh, you know, my mother-in-law from across, uh, across the country, so that's very nice, and also lots of friends and, and other folks, so it's good to see everybody. Um, uh, so thank you all for, for joining uh, to discuss an issue that's really become rapidly more urgent over the last few years. Uh, the disturbing rise of anti-Semitism in our region, uh, across the nation and around the world. And, you know, growing up proudly and publicly Jewish uh, in South Jersey, I never thought that uh, I would say that sentence, the rise of anti-Semitism in the region, uh, but here we are. And uh, I'm grateful to all of you for coming today to learn more about this issue and really what we, we can do uh, to help push back against uh, this, this trend. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover. Um, in, our, in our short time today. So I wanted to just quickly go over our agenda. Uh, I wanna give a brief intro to ADL uh, so you know who we are uh, and why we're qualified to have this conversation with you. Uh, then we're gonna talk about some shared understandings. We're gonna explore some key knowledge uh, that's uh, about bias and hate more generally that's gonna uh, inform the rest of our discussion today. Then we're going to do an overview of anti-Semitism so that we have a common language uh, and understanding so we know what it is and what it is not. Uh, and then we're going to dive into the, the meat of the presentation and the discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about anti-Semitism today. We'll talk about trends and statistics. We'll talk about the manifestations. What do those incidents look like on the ground? We'll talk about the sources of anti-Semitism today. And we'll talk about the rationale. Why is this happening and why now? So we'll, we'll talk then about prevention and response. What can we do as a community and as individuals to push back against anti-Semitism? And then uh, at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, so I, I know it's a, the full agenda and I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm uh, mindful of time. Uh, so I think the best thing to do is if you have questions, maybe put them in the chat for now uh, and uh, David can um, flag if there's any urgent ones uh, and then we'll, uh, try to answer everything during Q&A. We'll unmute folks during, during that section of the, the program. Um, so we've got a lot to cover and let's jump right in. Uh, so quickly, I, I wanna briefly introduce you to ADL uh, for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, ADL was founded in 1913 uh, with a dual mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all. Uh, it was a time of significant and rising bigotry of all kinds. Uh, and uh, so this was a, a pretty forward thinking mission and it hasn't changed in the last 107 years. So today we are the nation's leading organization fighting anti-Semitism and all forms of hate. Uh, and we do it through three main areas of work. We investigate, we advocate, and we educate. So just briefly on each of these, um, you know, we're an internationally renowned expert on hate. We monitor and expose hateful ideologies, hate groups, tactics in person and online. Uh, we respond to incidents in our communities. Um, we actually received 500 requests for assistance last year in the Philadelphia region alone. Uh, we're the largest non-governmental trainer of law enforcement in the nation uh, on extremism, terrorism, and hate crime. We train some 15,000 law enforcement officers every year, a thousand of which come from our region. And uh, we provide critical investigative assistance to law enforcement on over 500 extremist related cases every year, uh, including 30 in our region last year. So uh, it's a very important work that we're, we're lucky to, to be able to have that relationship with law enforcement to do it. Uh, we advocate, uh, we work, work to, push, to promote our mission at every level, top down, bottom up, 
uh, federal, state, local levels, all three branches of, of government. We uh, push for legislation to combat discrimination, to protect civil rights. We write amicus briefs in major court cases, and we build and lead diverse coalitions to push back against hate in our communities. Uh, and finally, we, we educate. We work to inoculate people against bigotry through our bias and bullying prevention, our Holocaust education, and our anti-Semitism education programs. And we've actually, uh, we, we're the leading anti-bias educator in the country. We've impacted uh, millions of children and adults since 1985 when our program started. And for the last 10 years, although unfortunately not this year because of the pandemic, uh, our walk against hate uh, has brought together thousands of people to celebrate diversity in, diversity in the Philly region. So uh, keep an eye out for our virtual walk in the fall. I'll keep you all posted about that. So, um, you know, who we are. Let's uh, jump into a discussion uh, first by understanding some of the key understandings that ADL has developed about hate over the last 107 years. Uh, these will inform the rest of our discussion. So the first is that bias is universal. Uh, it doesn't come from nowhere. It's a natural part of human nature. Uh, and so we believe that the best way to combat bias is not to ignore it, but to recognize it and challenge it in ourselves and others. However, while bias is universal and natural, prejudice and hate is not. Uh, it's a learned phenomenon, which means that it can be prevented and even unlearned uh, through in effective intervention. Uh, all forms of hate are equally serious and damaging. We're talking today primarily about anti-Semitism, but uh, we believe all forms of hate are equally painful. Uh, we don't believe in comparing suffering. All bigotry is wrong. It all needs to be addressed seriously and comprehensively. And that is in part because hate is interrelated. Uh, it shifts its focus to whomever is the most convenient target at a given moment. So therefore, if you care about hate against any one group, you have to care about hate against all groups. Uh, so uh, hate speech, we believe, is best combated by anti-hate speech. It's vile, but it's protected by the First Amendment, and we staunchly defend the First Amendment. Uh, so we believe that it's, you know, you should, we shouldn't be promoting censorship or criminalization of speech, but at rather education and, and anti-hate speech. The last two points are particularly important. Hate has an enhanced response uh, and requires, I'm sorry, an enhanced impact and requires an enhanced response. Uh, so they, they hit harder, hate incidents hit harder than normal conflicts because they target a immutable personal characteristic, uh, something that a, the victim cannot control. So this hits both more deeply and more broadly, more deeply because it, by magnifying the uh, psychological, social, and personal impacts felt by the victim, and more broadly because it really affects everybody in that victim's community. Uh, so uh, therefore, because of this enhanced impact, it requires an enhanced response. Um, and the last point, hate escalates when left unchecked, is perhaps the most un un important understanding when talking about hate. So I want to dive into this briefly just a bit more deeply. Um, this is our pyramid of hate. Uh, it's a, um, which we use to describe, uh, to sort of illustrate the insidious nature of hate. Um, and so hate, it kind of works like the proverbial uh, frog in the pot of boiling water. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, the, the, as the scientifically dubious analogy goes, if you throw a pot, uh, a frog into a pot of boiling water, she will jump right out. It's too hot. But if you put that frog in a pot of cool water and slowly raise the temperature, uh, the frog won't know until it's too late that it's reached boiling. Um, so very similarly, if someone promotes extreme violent hatred out of the blue, we'd condemn them as a bigot, we'd get it as a clear manifestation of hate, unacceptable. But if you slowly acclimate society to progressively more serious forms of bias, then we can enable more extreme expressions of bigotry. So at the bottom of the pyramid, if we allow biased attitudes to go unchecked, uh, they can become normalized and then individuals can start acting on those attitudes. Uh, and then when those individual acts of bias go unchecked, they too become normalized and societies can uh, uh, start adopting systemic discrimination, start acting systematically on those biases. And when discrimination goes unchecked, uh, it, it, becomes, it allows for more and more vicious individual and systemic expressions of hate to become possible. So the good news is that we can interrupt the escal escalation of hate before it goes too far. So uh, with those general understandings, let's uh, talk about anti-Semitism in particular. Uh, 
first, we should take a minute to develop a common language uh, around anti-Semitism. So here's ADL's definition. Uh, the anti-Semitism is the marginalization and or oppression of people who are or are perceived to be Jewish based on the belief in stereotypes and myths about Jewish people, Judaism, and Israel. And I've also included the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which ADL uh, encourages government agencies to adopt primarily because it's actually a lot longer than this and includes uh, a, a lot of examples uh, about exactly how uh, anti-Semitism can manifest. So it can really help governments uh, better understand and identify and respond to incidents. Uh, I just wanna say, as we're talking about anti-Semitism, uh, that we can define anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism doesn't define us. So um, as exemplified by uh, the BZBI family, uh, Jews are a community of rich beliefs and traditions and relationships. And while we have a long history of persecution, that is not what makes us who we are today. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. So as we said at the outset, uh, all forms of hate are equally painful and damaging, but they're not all the same. Uh, Anti-Semitism has some unique characteristics uh, that really help explain its spread and durability. The first is that it's well established. It's, it's known as the oldest hatred. Uh, there have been examples of anti-Jewish stereotypes and oppression for thousands of years, even back into biblical times. Uh, and because it's been around for so long, it's evolved to take many different forms. For instance, there's religious anti-Semitism during the Middle Ages, political anti-Semitism during the Enlightenment, racial anti-Semitism in the 20th century, national anti-Semitism after the creation of the State of Israel, and many more. And all of these forms live on today and continuously shift to fit current events and trends. Um, and because anti-Semitism has this shape-shifting capability, uh, it's been adopted across the ideological spectrum, which is really fascinating because you can have extremists on the far left and on the far right, Christian fundamentalists and Islamists. Uh, you can have white supremacists and black nationalists who disagree on literally everything, and yet anti-Semitism is a common thread amongst all of these ideologies. Um, anti-Semitism is persistent. It remains a constant presence around the world, uh, even in places where there are no Jews. And so this is why when Jews are doing well in a society, uh, the threat is never really negated. So for example, in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries, Germany was actually one of the top countries in Europe where Jews could succeed and enjoy some measure of equality. Uh, the change from that existence to uh, the government-sponsored genocide was so swift and, and destructive because the scaffolding it, for it was already there. It was always lurking under the surface. Um, and all of these traits stem from the fact that at its core, anti-Semitism boils down to one simple idea, that the Jews are to blame. Anti-Semitism alleges that despite their small numbers and apparent lack of influence, Jews possess secret power uh, and use this power to benefit themselves at the expense of everyone else. Uh, out of this idea grows all the conspiratorial thinking and stereotypes that have dogged Jews for millennia. Uh, so these five qualities have created a really pernicious and virulent uh, and dangerous hatred against Jews. Um, and they've created some very uh, disturbing uh, and widely held anti-Semitic stereotypes and conspiracy theories that continue to modern day. Um, this is not by any means a comprehensive list, but it's some of the, the most common tropes and stereotypes that I just wanted to touch on briefly. Um, so power, as mentioned, the idea that Jews have secret power, including control of the financial systems, the media, the government, et cetera, and they use it to benefit themselves at the expense of others. Disloyalty, the idea that Jews are more loyal to themselves or to Israel than to the countries in which they reside. Um, greed, the idea that Jews will try to enrich themselves by any means. Deicide, the idea that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus. Blood, the idea that uh, Jews use Christian blood, particularly the blood of children in their rituals. Uh, denial, the idea that Jews made up or exaggerated the Holocaust for personal gain. Anti-Zionism, the demonization and delegitimization of the state of Israel, including applying any of the other stereotypes on this list to the Jewish state. Uh, and finally, uh, I, we had to add this one recently, um, 
the, the idea of disease, that Jews are responsible for or somehow benefit from disease. Um, so we don't have time to go into each of these in detail now, but if you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer them during uh, Q&A. Um, so this brings us to anti-Semitism today. Uh, let's talk about trends. We'll talk about incidents, sources, and rationale for anti-Semitism today. And then I want to bring it really uh, up to date uh, in talking about anti-Semitism during the coronavirus. Um, we'll start with the numbers. ADL has tracked anti-Semitic incidents uh, annually since 1979 through our audit of anti-Semitic incidents. We measure assault, uh, harassment, uh, criminal and non-criminal harassment, and vandalism in, in the audit. Uh, and we gather data from direct reports from victims, uh, from law enforcement, from the media, uh, and also from partner organizations. So despite our best efforts to gather all this data, we know that the incidents are severely undercounted. But we believe that it's very important to look at the data. We can sort of uh, get a, a useful snapshot of, of anti-Semitism in a moment and understand trends over time. So let's dive into the data. The headline for uh, 2019 is that ADL recorded 2,107 anti-Semitic incidents nationwide. Uh, this was the highest number ever recorded since we've been doing the audit, uh, 40 years. And this is particularly disturbing due to the relatively recent history of below average anti-Semitism in the United States. So for most of the 21st century, and particularly from uh, 2004 to 2013, as you can see that downward slope on that line graph on the left, um, we saw a steady decline in incidents, bringing us to near record lows in 2013. And as recently as 2015, we were 30% below the national historic average. So, um, however, from 2015 to 2019, in less than half the time it took to get down, we skyrocketed back to record-breaking highs. Uh, the largest spike came over a two-year period, 2015 to 2017, including a 57% increase in 2017, which was unprecedented in almost 40 years. Um, this year, we've hit the record high. The incidents have also grown more violent. Uh, we measured a 54% increase in assaults last year leading to 61 assaults. Uh, that was the most we've ever recorded, and they affected 95 victims, including five people who lost their lives. Uh, we've also recorded 270 anti-Semitic incidents attributed to known extremist groups or to individuals inspired by extremist ideology. That was 13% of the total. And we measured a 19% increase in incidents at K through 12 schools. And unfortunately, the national trends bear out locally as well. Uh, I'm going to touch on Pennsylvania a little bit more in detail and then um, also talk about New Jersey and Delaware. But Pennsylvania enjoyed, just like uh, the national numbers, a decade of decline, followed by a surge from around 2015 to 2019, um, a 56% increase in 2016, 43% in 2017, a slight dip in 2018, but still much higher than the, than the state's historic average. Uh, and then last year, we saw 109 reported anti-Semitic incidents. This was a 22% jump, second highest ever recorded in the state, and fifth most in the country. Um, so uh, yeah, only New York and New Jersey and California and Massachusetts had more. Uh, Pennsylvania had a few trends that outpaced the national average, including incidents on campus, which increased 8%, uh, and incidents targeting Jewish institutions, which more than tripled. Uh, no, interestingly, 96% of all of these incidents in Pennsylvania took place in 19 counties in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, the majority of them took place in, uh, I'm sorry, the, the largest number took place in, in Philadelphia County, 52 incidents, and there are also a large number of incidents in Montgomery County and Delaware County and Bucks. Um, we think this is partly due to strong reporting in these counties and also because there's larger Jewish populations here as well. Uh, the uh, other states in the region also faced elevated anti-Semitism in uh, 2019. New Jersey had 345 incidents, which was a 73% increase from the prior year. It bumped New Jersey from the number three spot to the number two spot in the nation, uh, which was unfortunate. Uh, and it was the most ever recorded in the state. Um, 
you know, Delaware wins the award for a least number of incidents with six, but uh, that number is actually three times the state's historic average and three times the previous year's number. Uh, so not, not moving in the right direction in Delaware either. And if you take Delaware, just Southern New Jersey and just Eastern Pennsylvania, which is the region that uh, ADL Philadelphia serves, uh, 2019 capped an 159% increase over five years in anti-Semitic incidents. So this is, uh, this is a lot, but it's not the whole picture. Uh, we're, while the audit counts anti-Semitic incidents, it does not include online hate unless we're talking about targeted harassment. So uh, we, need to, we know that anti-Semitism abounds online. We need to be able to measure this as well. So we've been tracking online hate since the earliest days of the internet. We do so now primarily through our Center on uh, Technology and Society based in Silicon Valley. And I just wanted to, to feature a few uh, of their most recent findings. 53% uh, of Americans have experienced harassment online. Uh, and that includes 16% of 16% of Jews. 79% uh, of people who play games online have been harassed, uh, including tw nearly 20% of Jewish gamers. There are millions of anti-Semitic tweets every year. Uh, in 2017, there were uh, 4.2 million anti-Semitic posts. Uh, but this is an internet-wide problem. We have seen Twitter uh, crack down on anti-Semitism and hate and then measured uh, a enormous surge in uh, signups to other uh, online platforms such as Telegram and Gab, which was the platform that Robert Bowers, the Pittsburgh uh, Tree of Life shooter, uh, used to uh, promote his anti-Semitic views. Um, so it's not just a single platform's issue. This is an internet-wide problem. And interestingly, the word most strongly associated with hate speech online is the word Jew. So I think that's pretty disappointing and depressing. But there is some good news. Uh, this is, so uh, just a few weeks ago, ADL released the results of uh, our latest uh, poll on anti-Semitic attitudes. And if you remember from the pyramid of hate, uh, biased attitudes lay this foundation upon which acts of bias can take place. Uh, so it's important to, to know how people are feeling and thinking about Jews as well. And our, our poll gauges the extent to which people believe in anti-Semitic stereotypes. We ask a series of 11 anti-Semitic stereotypes and people who believe six or more, more than half, are considered to harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. So those statements include stuff like, Jews have too much power in the financial markets. Jews have too much control over the global media. Jews have too much control over the United States government. So our most recent poll in 2019, and you can see we hit a record low of 11%. Uh, and while that figure still represents some 33 million people believing six or more of those anti-Semitic stereotypes, this is a very positive trend. Uh, so how do we make sense of the rising number of incidents alongside a decreasing rate of anti-Semitic attitudes. And so what we believe is that this tells us that education and outreach are working. What we are doing as a community to fight anti-Semitism on the whole is working. Um, however, those who do harbor anti-Semitic attitudes feel more emboldened now than ever to act on their beliefs. Uh, so that small minority, that 11% is acting, is, is working double time uh, to, act on their anti-Semitism. So this is in America. Unfortunately, the rest of the world isn't so hot. Uh, 2014, we, we launched our global 100 poll, uh, and we've updated it in 2015 and 2019 in region, specific regions. We learned that 26% of the world, uh, representing some 1.09 billion people, harbors anti-Semitic attitudes. Uh, the highest rate, you may or may not be surprised, uh, were in the Middle East and North Africa and Eastern Europe after that. Um, the Americas and Oceania scored the lowest. Uh, and in 2019, we noticed spikes in European countries that have seen challenges to democracy. So including Ukraine, uh, Poland, and Russia. And we also noticed some declines in countries that have, that have uh, ro uh, robust democracies, including uh, France and Germany. So uh, interesting trends there as well. So it's a lot of data I threw at you, and, and I want to talk about what that data looks like on the ground. Uh, we need to remember that each one of those data points uh, represents real victims and real communities suffering real pain and real fear. Uh, so 
uh, I want to start by talking about some of the deadly anti-Semitic anti -Semitic attacks that we saw last year. And we should keep in mind, unfortunately, that there were many other attempts at violence against Jews. Uh, the FBI actually uh, arrested 14 white supremacists prior to attacking Jewish institutions over the last three years. Uh, and ADL was very grateful to be able to provide critical intelligence through our Center on Extremism to the FBI in a number of those cases that led to arrest and prosecution. But, so let's talk about some of those incidents. We'll work um, from December and then go back. Uh, on December 28th, 2019, in Muncie, New York, an African-American man walked into a rabbi's home uh, during a Hanukkah party and began stabbing people. Five people were injured, uh, and one later died from his wounds after months in the hospital. This was just one of at least 12 attacks against Jews that took place in th just the New York and Northern New Jersey region over the eight-day Hanukkah period. Two weeks before that attack, on December 10th, uh, an African-American man and woman shot and killed a Jersey City police detective uh, and then intentionally drove to J.C. Kosher Supermarket, where they killed three people and injured another. The assailants then barricaded themselves inside the store before being killed during a gunfight with police. So according to our Center on Extremism, the male attacker had posted hundreds of extremist posts on Facebook that included rabid anti-Semitism and hatred of police and white people. He was fascinated by the anti-Semitic teachings of the Black Hebrew Israelite Church, although he was not an official member of any group. Two months earlier on Yom Kippur, uh, a synagogue in Halle, Germany was attacked. Uh, a right-wing extremist with a shotgun tried unsuccessfully to enter the synagogue where approximately 80 congregants were worshiping. And after his failed attempt at the, at the synagogue, he began shooting at nearby individuals. He killed two people uh, and wounded two others, none of whom were associated with the synagogue. Um, and while this did not occur in America, so we didn't include it in our audit, uh, I bring it up because the shooter cited American anti-Semitic attacks as inspiration for his actions, which really shows that white supremacy and anti-Semitism are global terror threats. Just a few months before, on the last day of Passover in 2019, a 19-year-old white supremacist uh, opened fire inside the Chabad congregation of Poway, California, leaving one dead and three injured. In his manifesto, the shooter referenced Simon of Trent, uh, which was a blood libel charge from the medieval period. So these, these uh, stereotypes have stayed uh, to today. And finally, while, while it didn't occur in 2019, it's worth remembering that the Poway attack uh, came six months to the day of the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. Um, on October 27th, 2018, Robert Bowers, a white supremacist, entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh yelling, all Jews must die, as he opened fire with an AR-15, uh, killing 11 congregants. The shooter blamed Jews for illegal immigration, which he considered to be a tactic of Jewish-coordinated white genocide in America. So as you can see, we've recently seen a number of violent and brazen attacks across the Jewish community from anti-Semites across the ideological spectrum. Keep these incidents and their victims uh, in mind as we, as we dive deeper. Um, and it's important to remember that anti-Semitism is not a, a somewhere else problem. It's, it's happening right here, not to you know, these, these levels, thank God, but um, it's happening here as well. Um, so here's an example of some uh, incidents we saw in Eastern Pennsylvania in 2019. In January, uh, three students at Drexel compiled a to-do list that included shooting a Jewish student. In April, uh, at a Muslim American society celebration in Philadelphia, young children made speeches, danced, and lip sync to songs that glorified violence against Jews and Israel. Uh, in June, a man carved SS bolts and a swastika into pillars at the Philadelphia Holocaust Memorial. And in December, a Jewish man received an anonymous text message that read, see you soon, Kike, in Delaware County. Uh, these, were just, these are just four of the 109 incidents recorded in Pennsylvania last year. So where is this hate coming from? Um, the short answer is everywhere. Uh, Anti-Semitism has no political home. It can come from the right or from the left. It can come from majority communities or minority communities. So I want to take a few moments to briefly touch on some of the, I just checked the time, I think we're good, uh, to touch on some of the adherents of anti-Semitism. And, and remember that only 11% of Americans harbor anti-Semitic attitudes, but these are the extremists uh, who are emboldened right now to act on their hate. Um, 
Uh, it's important to say at this point, ADL is a 501c3. Uh, we do not promote or oppose any candidates or political parties. Our analysis is entirely apolitical. Um, we are not going to be discussing the mainstream political right or left uh, or any other mainstream movements. That said, please know that extremists are actively trying to mainstream their ideologies uh, into the, you know, into these, uh, into the mainstream uh, and have seen some success in recent years. So let's start with the single deadliest threat to Jews in the United States today. And that's extreme right-wing anti-Semitism, predominantly promoted by white supremacists. So some of the characteristics of this form of hate, they're often proudly and openly anti-Semitic. They are potentially and actually violent. And ADL uses a framework similar to law enforcement and the military when evaluating threats to the Jewish community. So we analyze intent, capability, uh, and trajectory. So if we apply that framework here, their intent is very high. Uh, Anti-Semitism is core to white supremacist ideology. Uh, while they hate many different groups, uh, they believe that Jews are the masterminds of an ongoing white geno genocide and therefore uh, were the foremost enemy of the white ra race. Um, so intent very high. Capability also very high. While the vast majority of white supremacists do not commit hate motivated violence, uh, white supremacists have been responsible for 60% of extremist related murders over the past decade, according to our Center on Extremism. Many have access to and affinity for firearms, uh, and white supremacist ideology was connected to 34 of the 42 extremist related murders in 2019. So intent high, capability high, trajectory growing. Uh, and if you listen to white supremacists in their own words, the movement has been extremely energized by the election and presidency of Donald Trump. Uh, many have lauded his comments uh, after Charlottesville that appeared to equate white supremacists and those protesting them. Uh, many have reveled in his adoption of alt-right talking points and memes, uh, and many view his, uh, some of his policy positions, especially on immigration, as dog whistles to their movement. Um, while not all white supremacists support him, many distrust him and hate him and hate that he has Jewish children and Jewish grandchildren, uh, most credit him for opening a door for their ideas to be mainstreamed. Uh, they're extraordinarily energized right now. So um, let's talk about extreme left-wing anti-Semitism, uh, which is a bit more complex. Uh, the, it's, it's more nuanced because it's uh, predominantly focused on Israel. And it's important to note here, as you know, that not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic by any means. Uh, just like it's okay to debate the policies and practices of the US government, it is okay to debate the policies and practices of the Israeli government. Uh, however, we believe that criticism of Israel crosses the line into anti-Semitism when it uh, violates Natan Sharansky's three Ds rule. If it demonizes Israel, if it uh, delegitimizes the state's right to exist, uh, or if it holds Israel to a double standard that no other country is held to. Um, Left-wing extremists are often very well aware of this line and they purposefully tow it without clearly crossing it. So the Jewish community needs to be very vigilant when combating this form of anti-Semitism. And another characteristic that we need to be aware of is denialism. Left-wing anti-Semites often hide behind their progressive credentials uh, and their stated values of inclusion and respect. And this idealist packaging actually means that there's higher potential to mainstream this form of anti-Semitism. Uh, so denialism also includes a denial of oppression of Jews. So as we said before, anti-Semitism is always a threat even when Jews seem to be doing well in a society but left-wing anti-Semites uh, deny this. They believe that Jews are not oppressed or marginalized and that they only enjoy privilege. So if we analyze this threat, uh, we can say that the intent is mixed. Uh, we did a, a deep dive into the BDS movement, which is the primary vehicle for left-wing uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, yeah, and we did it with uh, the Rayud Institute, which is an Israeli think tank. We found that the leaders of this movement are clearly anti-Semitic. They're trying to dismantle the state of Israel, um, but the vast majority of people participating in the movement uh, have no idea that that's the goal of the leaders of the movement. They, uh, they want to um, nonviolently pressure Israel into ending their current policies towards the Palestinians, not to destroy the state of Israel. So 
This means that as a community, we need to target our responses to BDS, uh, going after the leaders like we would go after hardened uh, right-wing extremists, uh, but educating and uh, engaging with the, the bulk of the participants in BDS to make sure that they understand what they're, uh, what they're really doing. Uh, so their intent is mixed. Their capability is frankly limited. Uh, at this time, the movement's been largely unable to inflict any real economic or political damage on Israel. Uh, this could rapidly change, but the more immediate concern is the increasing marginalization and harassment of American Jews in progressive spaces, uh, especially online and on campus. Uh, the BDS movement really contributes to an atmosphere on campus where more and more Jewish students feel isolated and can't have a normal life. Uh, so even if the intention is not anti-Semitic, the effect can be. Um, I, we also have to say that extremists on the left also engage in traditional anti-Semitic activities such as vandalism and harassment focusing on Israel. And the trajectory here uh, is growing. So these views have, been, have made a lot of headway among a small uh, but very vocal segment of the Democratic Party, including Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, and the movement's also been very effective uh, at connecting with other progressive movements so that it is very common, um, and I still can't wrap my head around it, but uh, anti-Israel chants are often heard at completely unrelated rallies for criminal justice reform, for immigration reform, and other progressive causes. So that's this picture on the left from Palestine to Mexico, these walls got to go. Uh, that is a a common refrain at a variety of different uh, progressive rallies. So let's talk about Islamist anti-Semitism. Uh, I'll just go, I'll, I'll try to speed this up a little bit. Uh, the intent is high. Uh, every major Islamic terror organization has promoted anti-Semitism. Uh, and mostly the, uh, most of the ideology centers on hatred of Israel, but they see Jews all over the world as fair game. Intent is high, capability is very high. Uh, they're extremely capable of harming Jews around the world. They're often battlefield tested. They can acquire weapons. They have global access. Um, there have only been 12 lethal domestic Islamic extremist incidents in the US over the last decade, but that's re they've resulted in over 100 deaths, so very lethal. Uh, the trajectory now is uncertain because major terror groups like ISIS continue to lose territory so they may be pre preoccupied with their own internal problems. However, they also may be more desperate and may be looking to garner attention and notoriety through um, uh, additional terror attacks. In our most recent report, which actually came out this week on Islamic extremism, we showed a 50% increase in America in arrests and plots linked to domestic Islamic extremism last year. Uh, so this may be a rising threat after all. Uh, and finally, I want to touch on uh, black nationalist anti-Semitism based on the recent surge of attacks in New York and uh, New Jersey uh, coming from individuals associating with uh, this movement, extreme black nationalism. Um, so the intent is really mixed. Uh, there's some influential leaders and groups such as Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam and the new Black Panther Party, uh, which have adopted the ideology that Jews uh, are to blame for all of the issues faced by African Americans. Uh, but for the most part, anti-Semitism is not central to Black nationalist thought. Uh, capabilities moderate. Uh, the data shows, our data shows uh, that there have been nearly 20 murders associated with extreme Black nationalism over the last two decades. But until recently, Jews were not a common target. Uh, 13 of, so the trajectory, however, is possibly growing. Uh, 13 of the 15, uh, of the 15 fatalities uh, that we, we measured over the last 10 years occurred in 2016 and 2017. They mostly targeted law enforcement, but there were three anti-Semitic attacks uh, allegedly motivated by extreme black nationalism in 2019. Muncie, Jersey City, and a third of stabbing in Florida. So something to definitely keep an, a close eye on. So we talked about the data, we've talked about the manifestations, we've talked about the sources, let's talk about the factors. Why is this rise in anti-Semitism happening? Why is it happening now? And we've tracked a few uh, main sources. One is normalization of anti-Semitism. Uh, so uh, after the Holocaust, the Western world felt uh, great shame for allowing anti-Semitism to grow to genocidal levels. And 
though anti-Semitism never really disappeared, this shame made it no longer acceptable in civil discourse. Uh, so as the Holocaust receded into history and memory, as evidenced by the numerous studies showing overwhelming ignorance of the Holocaust among young people today, uh, our society has really lost this sense of shame. And this has allowed anti-Semitism to once again return to the public square and to start following that process of normalization as depicted on the pyramid of hate. Polarization. And the political center in America is weakening, we're becoming more divided, and the extremes are growing stronger. And when extremes grow, it opens the door for anti-Semitism from the extremes to be injected into the mainstream. Anxiety. Whenever there is political or financial or social stress, anti-Semitism tends to rise as people look for scapegoats. And we'll talk more about that uh, when we get to the part on uh, coronavirus. Uh, social media, uh, it's been an enormous boon to the dissemination of hate. People are able to self-radicalize faster than ever before. They are proselytizing their hate in echo chambers. They're enjoying anonymity. Um, Anti-Zionism, which we talked about, uh, and politicization of anti-Semitism uh, is, a, is a, a big part of this. Uh, politicians and political parties and interest groups across the ideological spectrum uh, have, have uh, tried to weaponize anti-Semitism in recent years. They use it um, as a cudgel to attack their opponents uh, while tacitly tolerating it in their own uh, camps. So we think that the only real measure uh, to determine if someone is serious about co combating anti-Semitism is if they call it out on their own side or from their own community. Uh, it's, the, it's only effective if we fight anti-Semitism from the inside. We can't really do anything about it if we fight it from the outside. So we really need to be depoliticizing anti-Semitism in order to defeat it uh, because it's really a nonpartisan problem and it needs a bipartisan solution. So let's talk about anti-Semitism in the time of coronavirus. Uh, unfortunately, all of these factors are still in play. And we have not seen things slow down on the anti-Semitism front in 2020 so far. The pandemic has really sparked rising hate against a variety of groups. Uh, Asian American Pacific Islanders have seen a spike in hate crimes, Muslims, immigrants, and Jews as well. Uh, so I want to sort of talk about what that looks like throughout the pyramid. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid, we've seen a number of anti-Semitic tro tropes be updated uh, and, and circulated online, online in recent months. Um, they tend to touch on a few themes. One, that coronavirus is a tool for Jews to expand their global influence. Uh, two, that Jews are somehow profiting from the coronavirus. Uh, three, um, that they, uh, that um, uh, sort of like twisting it, using the coronavirus as a way to attack Israel or Jews. So we've seen these, these sort of uh, themes uh, regularly. Um, and We've also seen uh, at the next level up on the, uh, of the pyramid, the acts of bias, uh, anti-Semites have developed some new tactics during the pandemic, uh, which shows in real time how anti-Semitism can evolve. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, Zoom bombing is the practice of hijacking virtual meetings, just like this one, uh, to display graphic or threatening message, which usually include uh, hate speech. We've received multiple reports of anti-Semitic Zoom bombing in the Philly region uh, and many more across the nation. And so we've worked really closely with Zoom and other social media companies to uh, really tighten the security features and to help prevent and respond to this. Uh, if, you if you use Zoom, which you all do, uh, and, and you use the app on your, uh, on your computer, I recommend uh, uh, downloading the update, make sure you're using the most up-to-date version uh, so that you have access to all of the security features. So we've seen a lot of anti-Semitism at anti-shutdown protests. Uh, extremists are really leveraging the recent rallies to promote their ideologies. Uh, as you can see from this individual in the lower right-hand corner, uh, holding the sign that says the, the real plague, and it's a uh, picture of a, a Jew dressed as a rat. Um, we have seen uh, white supremacist individuals uh, and groups uh, going to these rallies and really trying to network uh, and expand uh, their, their uh, influence. We've also seen a lot of Holocaust and Nazi references on display. Um, not all of them are anti-Semitic. They're, they're all offensive, but they're not all technically anti-Semitic. Um, but, um, you know, the things that we, we have called them all out. Um, you know, one I wanted to mention was on the upper left-hand corner, 
uh, Heil Pritzker. Pritzker is the uh, governor of Illinois. He's Jewish, and there uh, have been a lot of charges uh, connecting him to Adolf Hitler, which is uh, pretty horrific. Um, closer to home in Pennsylvania, uh, last week a Pennsylvania state lawmaker made a Nazi analogy regarding Governor Wolf, uh, as did uh, this week a county level political party uh, and a school, school board member in the region. Uh, all in the last two weeks. So we've been seeing this, uh, seeing this a lot. And today you may have read uh, in the Inquirer an op-ed condemning this phenomenon, it may have been yesterday, condemning this phenomenon. Uh, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, we've seen a lot of real world propaganda uh, featuring anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. Uh, and then at, towards the top of the pyramid, we've seen anti-Semitic violent plots in the last few weeks. Um, so in March, uh, a white supremacist named Timothy Wilson plotted to blow up a hospital near Kansas City, Missouri uh, in a, an attempt to cause mass casualties. He was killed in a shootout with the FBI prior to him being able to carry out the attack. Uh, but during the investigation afterwards, they found his social media was uh, uh, completely filled with uh, hatred of the Jews. Um, they, he considered uh, Jews responsible for the virus, and he allegedly considered attacking an attacking a synagogue instead of the hospital. Uh, in April, in another incident, John Rathbun was arrested for attempting to bomb a Jewish nursing home in Massachusetts during the pandemic. So we're seeing this uh, still go on today. So what can we do about it? Uh, how do we how do we prevent and respond to anti-Semitism now that we know it's alive and well. Uh, and, and the answer is that it's really important to combat anti-Semitism and any form of hate really, wherever it lies on the pyramid of hate. Uh, but it's really important that we are targeting and tailoring our responses to the specific incident. Because if we don't respond proportionally and effectively, we actually risk exacerbating the problem and hardening people's biases. So. At the lower levels of the pyramid, um, we want to uh, we want to meet words and ideas with counter speech and education, uh, and we'll talk more specifics about what you can do in the moment in a second. But if you feel safe, you want to interrupt the incident, you want to speak out, and you want to show support for the target of the bias incident. When bias becomes adopted society wide uh, as discrimination. Uh, it's really critical that we're advocating to our elected officials, that we're participating in community events, we're building coalitions uh, and relationships to magnify our impact. Um, so we need to push our government officials to alleviate the problem of anti-Semitism, including by supporting specific legislation, such as the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, the Never Again Education Act, which just passed the Senate, uh, and the No Hate Act. And we also need to really work to depoliticize anti-Semitism, as mentioned before, by championing bipartisan efforts, such as the Congressional Bipartisan Task Force on Anti-Semitism. And ADL has been really uh, leading on this. We just recently featured uh, Representative Brian Fitzpatrick and Representative Susan Wild, a Republican and a Democrat, both on the committee, to talk together about how anti-Semitism is a problem for everybody. Um, so uh, we, we also, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important that while we're doing all of this, all of our advocacy, it's important that we're defending our credibility. And it's also important that we're defending the democratic values in the process, because the rights enshrined in the First Amendment are actually our best defense against anti-Semitism. That means we should really not be supporting any measures that limit free speech, even if we oppose the speech and think it's hateful. And we should not be, uh, we should be opposing measures that violate the establishment clause, even if we think that measure would seem to benefit Jews. Um, we should also be sure that we're being very careful about what we label as anti-Semitism. We spend as much time at ADL saying what is not anti-Semitic as what it is, as what is, uh, and that's why people listen when we raise the alarm. Um, so finally, when, when bias motivated violence starts to occur, it's critical to report it to law enforcement and that we are equipping law enforcement and elected officials to respond effectively uh, at those higher levels. Um, and if they don't, it's important that we're holding them accountable. So if we can challenge hate effectively at each of these levels of the pyramid, we can prevent it from escalating. I wanna jump back to the bottom of the pyramid just for a second. Uh, talk about what you can do if, if you witness anti-Semitism in the moment. Um, these are some best practices. Uh, first, you wanna assess the situation. You need to think before you act, determine if it's safe to respond in the moment. There, were, there have been some uh, terrible um, situations where people intervened 
uh, with a, a, an individual who was wielding a weapon and it, it, was, it ended up in, in violence. Um, so we do not recommend you do that. Um, but if you think it is safe to respond, determine really what it is you want to accomplish. Uh, do you want to interrupt the incident? Do you want to educate the perpetrator or the broader community? Do you want to support the victim? All of the above. Uh, so you want to consider your options for intervention. You want to talk about whatever you do, you make sure is reasonable and results-based. Uh, and you want to engage in respectful dialogue. So if, the, if it was a slip of the tongue, you can have that conversation now. If something came out in a heated moment, maybe you wait uh, until heads have cooled. Um, so here are some speak up strategies. First, uh, it's really important that we assume good intent. Uh, often people don't even mean to be offensive, don't realize that they're being offensive or anti-Semitic, and they're quick to correct their words and actions if engaged respectfully. Um, so here's some, some tactics. You can, you can ask a question. You can say, well, what do you mean by that? What does that comment mean? Um, and make them explain. You can interrupt and redirect. You can say, you know, I, I don't like those kinds of jokes. I would prefer you not make them in front of me. Uh, you can broaden uh, a stereotypical comment to universal human behavior. You could say, you know, greed isn't really a Jewish trait. Uh, I know a lot of people that are greedy, that aren't Jewish. Um, and, or you can make it individual. So, you know, in my experience, that hasn't been my understanding or my experience with uh, Jews, that sort of thing. Um, you can also uh, work with ADL to magnify your impact in the region. Um, there's lots of ways you can work to uh, bring anti-bias training to your schools, uh, use our online advocacy center to uh, uh, reach out to Congress, uh, bring security resources to your religious institutions. Uh, I know BZBI has been really on the, on the forefront of, of security. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, contact your law enforcement agencies, ask, make sure that they're in touch with us because we work very closely with them. Uh, and of course, if you can only support one organization, it should be BZBI. But if you can support a second organization, uh, consider supporting ADL. So um, I want to conclude uh, by talking, remembering some voices um, about why it's important to care about anti-Semitism. This first quote is from Deborah Lipstadt, who's a renowned scholar on anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Uh, and her quote shows that rising anti-Semitism is often the sign of a society drifting towards authoritarianism uh, and restricting individual liberties. So anyone who really cares about democracy needs to care about uh, anti-Semitism. Rabbi Sachs is the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. His quote illustrates that uh, the same mindset that allows people to hate Jews also allows them to hate other groups uh, based on race, religion, any other perceived difference. And as we've said before, if you care about hate against anybody, you need to care about hate against everybody. Um, and then finally, MLK sums it up quite nicely uh, because hate against Jews, like hate against any group is wrong. It's a simple idea. Uh, and I like to think that um, if anti-Semitism has been so successful because it is a simple idea, then perhaps it takes an equally simple idea such as this to finally stop it. Um, so I just want to draw your attention at last to the, um, the photo on the right, which was taken at the No Hate, No Fear uh, March in New York in January, uh, where some 25,000 people showed up, uh, all backgrounds and beliefs to demonstrate solidarity against anti-Semitism. So this can happen. We can do this. Uh, we can fight anti-Semitism. It's everybody's business. And if we work together, we will succeed. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so uh, there have been a number of questions, um, Jeremy. Great. And um, I'm going to um, turn first to um, Arlene Fickler, who uh, had a, both a question and a comment, a uh, question about uh, the ratio of um, of anti-Semitic incidents to Jewish population. Um, Arlene, did you want to ask that question? Sure. Um, thank you. Jeremy, thank you for an excellent presentation. Thank you, Arlene. Um, uh, I was struck by the map that had um, dark areas in New York, Pennsylvania, and um, California. And, and um, I was wondering whether ADL ever does any analysis of the relationship between anti-Semitic incidents and population, either the Jewish population or the general population, to see whether, in fact, anti-Semitism is 
more prevalent where there are Jews, less prevalent where there are fewer Jews, or more prevalent? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Yeah, we, um, we have noticed that anti-Semitism uh, is a bigger problem where there are more Jews. Um, but actually, that's a, a great opportunity for um, ADL to be working with local federations because federations are really taking the lead on uh, the population studies like here in Philadelphia. Um, so I think that there's great data sharing potential there uh, to really dive down into the, the figures and get a, a hold on this uh, uh, empirically. And my comment, which David referred to, was I put a link in the chat box to Shira's op-ed today. Oh, thank you. Shira being Jeremy's colleague at ADL. Shira yes. Good. Yes. My, my, uh, the regional director, not my daughter, who is also Shira. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Arlene. Um, we also had uh, a couple of questions from um, Steve Sherbin. And um, uh, Steve uh, asked some questions about the definition of um, anti-Semitism and also uh, the difference between Islam and Islamist society. So, Steve? Uh, well, first of all, I had, I had asked about the, um, the um, definition that's, that's given by the uh, international IHRA, why there was something about manifestations towards non-Jews. And that didn't make sense to me as being part of the definition of anti-Semitism. Great. So, um, yes, the uh, manifestations towards non-Jews uh, refers to incidents in which a person may be perceived to be Jewish, but not, it isn't Jewish. So, for instance, we would uh, consider likely the um, attack outside Halle, Germany, where that uh, individual shot four people outside of the synagogue, uh, to be anti-Semitic, even though none of those four people were Jewish. Okay, it, it, it just seems like a misleading definition. I think ADL's uh, terminology is much better and much much simpler and more straightforward. And the IHRA probably should say something like Jews and people perceived as Jews or, or whatever, uh, in any event. Um, the, I just had also just made a comment about when you were talking about Islamist anti-Semitism, that we be careful to uh, differentiate, uh, you know, and you're exactly right, it's, it's Islamist, but that's different from Islamic. Um, Islamist is a particular extremist tendency among Muslims, but it does not necessarily represent, uh, you know, the feelings of the, you know, the one billion plus Muslims in the world. Absolutely, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, it's, you're exactly right. Okay, there, there was uh, one other set of questions that came from Neil Sussman, but it looks like he's left the, um, he's left the meeting. Um, his questions primarily uh, anticipated some of your discussion okay. about uh, leftist um, issues related to, you know, um, to anti-Semitism and his concern that um, we do need to maintain awareness of uh, anti-Israel leftists. Um, he also made a mention of uh, a figure that I, I'm not sure um, about, but uh, seems interesting that um, Islam is responsible for 22 of the 24 regional uh, conflicts around the world. So I don't know if that's something you'd heard about before. Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with that statistic. I, I would say back to Stephen's point, I wouldn't say that Islam is responsible for it. I would say, local adherence of fu fundamental interpretation of Islam uh, or Islamic extremists um, may be involved. I, I, I can't comment beyond that, but I think to Stephen's point, it's important that we're using uh, language that um, is uh, specific talking about extremists. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and then uh, I'm told that, um, hang on here. Um, Jeremy, I have a question if there's time left. Sure. Having trouble finding you. you. Rebecca Krasner <laughs> is actually Hi, Rebecca. Uh, Rabbi Abe's. Hi. You are. <laughs> we froze for a minute. Um, Jeremy, I really struggle um, as someone who was in college post BDS to um, 
dialogue with Jews who are aligning with BDS um, and specifically the generation that's currently in school and has recently graduated. Um, and I'm wondering if you have um, insight or tips about how to have meaningful conversations um, with Jewish people who are supporters of BDS. It's a really good question and a hard one. Um, and we can really sort of break up that group into two subgroups. One is uh, sort of the, the true believers in BDS. And I would put folks that are um, uh, associating with uh, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, um, and some of these other groups that really, you know, we consider them um, extreme anti-Israel groups, uh, even though they, they you know, they're, have Jewish in the name, they talk about peace. I mean, they're, they're really, um, we find them to, I mean, primarily they serve as a shield uh, to protect um, the extreme anti-Israel uh, wing from charges of anti-Semitism because they can say we're Jewish and we're welcome here. Um, it's uh, very, very problematic. And I'm not sure how to engage directly with those folks except um, to keep trying and to not uh, uh, lose your cool, <laughs> uh, but you're not likely to, to win an argument. Um, but with most folks, again, it's, it's uh, you know, that, that long tail, you know, those JVP would be considered, you know, the leaders of the BDS movement. And most, you know, Jews who participate in BDS or support BDS um, are, uh, is really a lack of education. Um, what is the forum for education once they've already been educated? It's, you know, conversation, it's, uh, you know, talking, you know, film, it's, you know, it's really a full court press, whatever you can do. Um, and ADL is happy to, to help. We have a number of, of programs on campus, uh, our, our Think, Plan, Act resource. We work with campuses across the region, across the country. Um, and if you know somebody in particular, you know, I'm happy to work with you uh, to, um, to talk about, about this. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Really thoughtful. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, it was a it was a very very good presentation, Jeremy. Certainly opened my eyes to a lot of things that I hadn't considered before. Um, those are all of the questions that we had. Um, I, um, I I would open the floor to anyone who wants to unmute and ask a last question. But um, yeah, I, uh, David, good. I'd like to jump in. Jeremy, first of all, thank you very much for the for the presentation. It was uh, eye opening. Well, thank um, you. Going back to the distinction between Islamic and Islamists. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you found in terms of um, members of the Islamic community proactively stepping up and supporting the efforts of ADL? So that's a good question. Um, we have actually some pretty strong relationships with uh, a number of mosques in the area. Um, you know, after the, the Tree of Life shooting, um, the Muslim community came out uh, very strong um, uh, as a whole. Um, we work very closely with the Interfaith Center of Greater Philadelphia, um, which works to sort of facilitate these uh, interfaith conversations and, and coalitions. Um, so um, we would say, you know, mainstream, you know, Islam, like mainstream Judaism, uh, you know, we're on the same page. We both go to each other's, uh, you know, uh, events and celebrations and, um, you know, we're, we're uh, creating a, a community of, of allyship. Um, but, you know, of course, that's not everybody in Philadelphia. It's not everybody in um, the uh, in, in the world. Um, you know, for instance, I mentioned the Muslim American Society uh, incident last year in April, uh, where those children were, were being taught to sing horrific anti-Israel songs, talking about cutting off the heads of Zionists. Uh, it was international news. Uh, and that happened right here in, in Philadelphia. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, the Islamic community on a whole, uh, you know, we, we shouldn't be uh, putting, we shouldn't be casting aspersions on them because of the, uh, the efforts of a, a small minority, um, but we should be focusing on the, the efforts of that small minority. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Not 
Okay. Not even from your parents. Not even from my parents. <laughs> okay. You don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you you can you can call me after. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> thanks, Ed. Um, thank you everybody for for uh, being here, and uh, thanks again, David and and BZBI for having me. It was an excellent presentation, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Yashikawa. <laughs> thanks, David. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, thanks Jeremy. Jeremy. Looking forward to seeing you in Shul. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Bye. And thank you, David. You're welcome. Take care. Yes. Bye. Let's see. I see a band somewhere. Okay. okay.